Coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. Good evening, folks. I'm Matt Norlander. Hello to everyone on YouTube. Welcome to the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. This is a reaction show to a Saturday filled with eight second round games. We went from 68 to 66 to 64 to 48 to 32, and now we are down to 24 teams left in this men's NCAA tournament. David Cobb is here with me. We are going to talk about every single one of those games. GP is in studio for CBS Sports Network tonight. He went super late on Friday night with Kyle Boone, so now we are tapped in and we are going to do this for you here. And we got a lot to talk about. Creighton and Oregon just played an incredible game, and we are going to get to that after the break. But I'm going to start on a, a fairly huge headline that came about about, I don't know, two hours or so before I was expecting it to maybe, maybe pop on Saturday night, and that is Dusty May going to Michigan. Now, normally, I would be tournament first, tournament second, tournament third. However, Dusty going to Michigan when a lot of people thought he was going to go to Louisville, that registers as a very, very big headline that will um, – catalyze some movement on the carousel over the next 24 to 48 to 72 hours. So we'll hit on Tusty May real quick here first. We'll eventually do a coaching carousel episode on the pod as we always do and kind of break down a bunch of stuff that'll be coming later. But Dusty May is as big of a headline as, as anything in the tournament on Saturday. David Cobb, thanks for joining me on the pod here. What is your reaction, your uh, immediate thoughts on a Michigan landing its man and pulling Dusty May away from FAU? Yeah, man. Uh, kudos to you for going toe to toe with uh, with Woj on on the breaking news there. That's that's never <laughs> never an ideal scenario. Well, uh, real it? real quick on that. Credit to Woj, you did get it out first. I was literally talking on CBS Sports HQ about NC State holding off against Oakland, and I got a call from a source, and so I uh, I lost about two and a half minutes there. So uh, all too happy to have we broke it down for a good ten minutes on HQ. But, uh, but I appreciate the nod there. Uh, there could not have been a worse moment to receive that phone call than when I was in the middle of a segment talking on television. Uh, but nevertheless, here we are, Dusty to Michigan. Give me, give me your thoughts. Well, like one of the reasons I like covering college basketball as opposed to the NBA, which I did previously, is because college basketball news is actually broken by more than like three people. There's actually a lot of people who break news in college. So I'm like, whoa, just go back to the NBA, man. But uh, anyway, no, uh, the, my first thought was – why Michigan? Because the, the idea, right, is that you're Dusty May, you have options. And I look at Michigan, I reflect on Caleb Love not getting into school there. I reflect on Hunter Dickinson leaving there because he maybe didn't feel like they were a serious enough basketball program. Uh, but here we have Dusty May very much affirming uh, Michigan by saying, hey, I could go uh, to, to a number of jobs and I'm going to go to the Michigan job. And so I'm just kind of curious from your standpoint, why why michigan um here's my understanding of this and i'll try and again we're gonna be trying to be quick on the dusty stuff here uh not trying gp up this first segment yeah buddy i went there we're gonna try and keep it quicker um i did obviously see dusty may i was i'm covering i'm in stanford here at hq uh our hq studios here but i was at the tournament in brooklyn on friday and i'm going back in, in the morning to cover the second round there uh so i interviewed dusty for hq after the loss i asked him for a timeline he didn't give one um, and then in checking in with sources Saturday night and then into Sunday, um, I was curious. I did, I mean, I did get dusty, uh, quickly on Sunday. And at that point, um, he was undecided and that's pretty much all I had. And then I had to kind of, you know, go through other, other avenues as well. Um, it was indicated to me that there might be a chance that before the end of, if I said Sunday, I'm sorry, I meant Saturday. It's uh, Sunday is tomorrow. Again, what is time? Whatever. It's an illusion. And uh, lo and behold, he picks Michigan here. And now people thought he was going to go to Louisville. I think Louisville was uh, in a position where I thought it might be in the lead here. A little behind the scenes stuff is that Vanderbilt was actually, actually um, a real player in this more than I think people realized. But wow. when you have Louisville coming after you and Michigan, and both of those are offers are on the table along with Vanderbilt then you it's not that you don't have a choice, but those are much, big, much bigger programs. Uh, my understanding on this is always when you've got Louisville and the pressure, it's a better program. To me, Louisville's a better job than Michigan. Doesn't mean you can't. Michigan's a very, very good job as well. To me, Louisville's a top 10 job in the country. Michigan's a top 20 job in the country. But there's not as much pressure there. Um, and asking around on the Michigan job in the past week or so, one thing that was emphasized to me was when it, who, whomever that, Michigan was going to bring in 
the the person, the personality could not be bigger than the program itself, especially coming off the Howard stuff. Not that Howard had this huge, immense personality. In fact, he was not media friendly whatsoever, but he carried obviously a, a lot of significance within that program. But they don't want anyone messing up with football. Let football do its thing. Get out of the way. You have success at, at, at Michigan basketball. They want you to have success, but don't step in the way of uh, of everything, all the attention that's going there with football. I think not having as much pressure, probably being at a slightly better entry point in terms of what May believes of what Michigan is now versus what, what Louisville is. Louisville, they both coming off terrible seasons. I mean, but Louisville's coming off a worse one. And the Big Ten maybe having, you know, a little bit more financial – Flexibility being, you know, in a in a billion dollar multimedia deal with an eighteen team league, uh, I can make cases for Louisville over Michigan, uh, but this is the this is the route that he chose. I thought both of them fit him well, frankly, uh, and we'll see if it winds up being the right choice here. My understanding on the Louisville job though is like Louisville's not hurting with NIL. Like Louisville will have, as I understand it, Louisville's job and everything that from an NIL perspective that will come with it is going to be as competitive as essentially almost any other program that's out there heading into this portal recruiting cycle upcoming in this uh in this spring and summer so that's that's certainly something to keep in mind there as louisville now um moves uh moves ahead and real quick just as an aside for that um in talking with a few sources on saturday night shaheen holloway of seton hall is a name that is very involved in there uh, amir abdul rahim of south florida is a name that is involved in there and there will be others that bubble up. I think Pat Kelsey is someone that is going to get involved there. And then I get curious on guys who I don't know if Louisville has like reached out to yet, but I almost wonder, like Mark Pope, he went to Kentucky. I think he might be able to thrive there. Uh, maybe maybe Musselman comes back around. I'm not entirely sure. His name was like kind of attached to it early, but that was never really real. We'll see on Louisville. We'll update that further down the road. But Dusty, to to Michigan now, this move, Cobb, is going to catalyze other movement. Basically, what was happening here was whenever FAU lost in the tournament, there would be quick movement on, on, on Dusty May. And the expectation was within 48 hours of FAU season ending, we would have an answer on May. That is indeed what happened. And so now Louisville search takes a certain direction. And then other schools that are kind of tertiary to all this where will what will Vanderbilt do now that you know it wasn't banking on Dusty May, but Dusty May was they were waiting to see if he was going to say no to that. Where does Vanderbilt go now with its search? And it's you know it's got a few names uh, there that are very involved, and there are names that are still coaching in the tournament that are involved with Vanderbilt. Uh, the Vanderbilt opening and candidates there is attached to the West Virginia opening and candidates there, and attached to the Oklahoma State opening and there are candidates there. So we are going to have a little bit of a cascade here over the next few days before we get off on this and. Uh, and start talking at the tournament. Any other uh, kind of thoughts on if you think Dusty May to Michigan uh, is the better pick for him, uh, and any just anything connected to this uh, to this headline here on Saturday Night Cup? Well, it's easier to win at Louisville in the ACC than it is to win at Michigan because Michigan's in the Big Ten and the Big Ten's tougher. So from that standpoint, I would have thought Louisville might be more attractive. Uh, I do have a question for you though. Obviously, Michigan's a tradition-rich school. Uh, there's a great heritage of coaches there. I mean, Jawan Howard had some success. He followed John Beeline, who took him to a national title game. Uh, but one thing that jo Jawan Howard did was uh, he struck an opposing assistant coach in the postgame handshake line. I'm curious, do you think Dusty May continues that, or do you think that'll just be something that was unique to Jawan? A little too cynical here on a Saturday night, technically early Sunday morning, Cobb. No, I do not believe that will be the case there. Dusty May obviously carries uh, quite a quite a good reputation across the sport. Uh, ironically enough, though, he was a manager for Bob Knight, and we are familiar with the late Bob Knight. We are familiar with uh, the many things that are attached to Knight's legacy, one of them not exactly being the squeakiest, uh, cleanest image there. But no, um, this is a this is a, a big-time image shift from everything and, the, and what the program – had you know kind of devolved onto you know under under Howard there were obviously uh, multiple issues and, and even the the circumstances under which he got fired um, were just you know the uh, Michigan's at a low here and it needs someone to come in and adjust the program significantly. I got asked by Hakeem Dermish on CBS Sports HQ on Saturday night like what's success for Dusty May in his first contract? He's on a five year deal oh, by the way, and I would expect that deal. I don't have a figure for you right now. I would expect. Michigan getting dusty. Um, I would think he's going to be around four and a half. Maybe his agent would have gotten around five or so. Um, success for me is minimum of three NCAA tournaments in a five-year span. Minimum 
Uh, and not just squeaking in, but having room to spare at least one second weekend appearance and no, it's wild to say this because it's about to be an 18 team league. No 18, 17, 16, 15, or 14th place finishes. Not even in year one. You go in, you use, you utilize NIL and you try and catapult this. Dusty May is the best coach in FAU history. This team he just had, it is fair to say it underachieved. It was preseason top 10 level kind of team, got into the tournament, was overseeded, didn't win a tournament game, blew three or four games this season that it should not have blown. Uh, it was a good team, but that team with all of the expectations on it didn't handle itself well. And then down the stretch, you know, Dusty May, when his name becomes an even hotter prospect, they don't even get to the American Athletic Championship game. And then they they squander away an opportunity on on Friday in Brooklyn where Janelle Davis thinks he's got 15 seconds when he's got six and doesn't even get the right shot off. And then they go to overtime and Northwestern wins and they take it away. So that's an overlook at at uh, at Dusty Made in Michigan. We'll continue this stuff more as we uh, as we drift further and further away from the NCAA tournament. But let's talk all the games because we've got to get to eight games and we're not going to go too, too long. At least I hope not. So we'll talk Creighton. And Oregon playing the last game of the day was the best game of the day. I've talked way too much in this first segment. Cobb's going to be holding down the court plenty. But first, Nada, can I get a word from those partners? It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the final four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. So we're going to hit every single result here and we're going to start in the Midwest region and get to all that first, that, that corner of the bracket and third seed of Creighton winning in double OT 86, 73. You want to talk about a final score that is not indicative of the game that we saw, saw played. Come on now. Come on now. That was, that was a thrill that took us well past midnight on the East coast here. Um, I got a few stats and nuggets for you. But I'm going to shut up. Cobb, it's all you. You watched how this game played out. Your thoughts on on the Blue Jays avoiding an upset at the hands of Oregon and avoiding taking a loss to their former coach, Dana Altman. Yeah, this one is, is stats and nuggets galore. You got seven total bench points combined from both teams in a game that lasted 50 minutes. That's incredible. Uh, Jermaine Kuznard and Infali Dante scored every single point for Oregon in the second half. Just an incredible performance by those guys, even in defeat. I mean, Stephen Ashworth uh, took uh, Jack Golke, uh for a run for his money in terms of three-pointers attempted in Pittsburgh this weekend, right? Uh, with 18. Uh, well, he had 18 field goal attempts, but 15 three-pointer attempts. I mean, mm -hmm. anyway, he ended up hitting a couple of big shots. But, man, it just uh, – if Oregon had won that game and Folly Dante, for me, was going to creep into – third team All-American consideration on my CBS Sports All-American ballot uh, here here in a week or so. But, man, uh, what, what what a banger. What a way to end the night. It, I wasn't, I'm not going to sit here and say it was the best day, just in terms of the drama, the upsets, and all of it. But uh, the, nightcap, the nightcap was pretty phenomenal. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was a really good way to end a day. That was just okay. Uh, we can we can be fair about this. Saturday's second round action was was just okay. Give it a give it a solid B uh, all around there. Oregon was hampered because Jackson Shellstad got injured, and so he was unavailable down the stretch there. But even getting to OT, a uh, big bucket by Baylor Shireman, just a just a soft baby Dirk fadeaway on the uh, on the off foot there to even get it to that point. Jermaine Kuznard was outrageous. There was at one point, I think, 32 or 34 straight points scored by either in Folly Dante or Jermaine Kuznard coming from second half into overtime. Um, they were studs. I'll give you a, I'll give you a lot of the details here. Creighton is in back-to-back -back Sweet 16s for the first time in school history. Um, it, it it got everything it possibly could have out of its starters here. I mean, even Kalkbrenner hitting a tray in double overtime that wanted to kind of like be like, we're done. Okay, that's about enough here. Kalkbrenner showing up huge with 19 points, 14 rebounds, five blocks. Stephen Ashworth had a couple of big threes. He's good for that, man. He had 21 points. That's a team high. Ten of those points came in the two overtimes, Trey Alexander, 20.7 rebounds, five assists. Um, man, oh man, that was just, uh, that was incredible. I saw, I saw on the tweet machine, Rob Anderson, uh, Creighton SID, uh, just an incredible one. He's, he, Creighton is now 2-0 and all time in double overtime in the NCAA tournament. The other one was 2002, first round, beat Florida 83-82. Uh, your boy remembers that because I had wrist surgery that morning at like 7 a.m., 
and I came out of my haze, my post, uh, my post surgery haze, broke this bad boy playing hoops back in 02. And I was barely awake, but I remember watching. I remember watching Creighton win that game in the first round in double OT. Barely. I was like, someone wake me up. Wait, I got to watch the tournament. And, sure, and sure yeah, enough. I got to know more. What happened? Like, how did you break your wrist? No, nah, it's, 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 it's not a good. I, a casual trip over a defender playing a, uh, I want to say a Sunday rec game or something like that. Because I, I got it hurt. I got it looked at and then on a Monday and then they were like, you got to have surgery by Thursday. And then sure enough, like I I got it done early that morning. And that was, uh, that was that tournament, man. Then I was, then I was, yeah, I was Oh three. I think it was Oh three. Cause I was casted up and I'm almost positive. I, I, I had my cast on and then, yeah, I was, uh, I remember cause that was your Syracuse one and dated a girl at Syracuse went up there. A bunch of people signed the cast, whatever. No one cares. Um, Jermaine Cousinard, 32 points. 13 of 33 from the field, 6 of 12 from three-point range. He had 72 points in the tournament. It's the fifth most ever for a player in his first two career tournament games. Him and Dante. Dante went for 28 points, 20 rebounds, three assists, two steals, two blocks. Insane. Insane stats for those two. 60 of, of Oregon, 73 points, Cobb, in this game. Just incredible. I love the big man matchup in this game, Ryan Cockbrenner and Infali Dante. The way Oregon was putting Creighton uh, in the pick and roll uh, exposed Creighton in a way that they rarely get exposed. I, I love the the veteran storylines with Infali Dante. Everything he persevered through as a five star prospect in the class of 2019, how long it took, how much he had to fight through. Uh, to get to the point where he was on this big stage, to will Oregon to a place where it was on the doorstep of the Sweet 16 in his fifth year of college basketball. Incredible. Then you look at Ryan Kalkbrenner, and you want to know why it's important to have veterans in college basketball. I love to see if I can find these like big picture sort of takeaways from the, certain moments in these NCAA tournament games. And here's one on Ryan Kalkbrenner. His freshman year in 21, he hit zero three-pointers. His sophomore year in 22, he hit three three-pointers. In 2023, his junior year, he hit six. Coming into tonight, he'd hit 15, and he'd begun to show the ability to hit the outside shot with a bit more regularity. Then in that second OT, Creighton is up three, a little over three minutes to go. He finds himself alone at the top of the key, and, and he hits one. And that's a shot that that freshman version of Ryan Cockrenner doesn't make. It's a shot that sophomore version of Ryan Cockrenner could make but probably wouldn't take. Uh, last year, even he only hit six. And now here he is, fourth year in college basketball. He has confidence in taking that shot. He makes it, helps carry Creighton to a victory. That's why having veterans in college basketball is important. Really good story for Oregon. The Pac 12 was at 1.6-0. Now it's six and two. Washington State, we'll get to them in a little bit. Also took an L here. Um, man, just uh, a really, really entertaining game. And Jermaine Kuznard, hats off to you as well. That was that was highly entertaining. Uh, really, really good stuff. Really fun game. Big swings. Uh, Trey Alexander did not hit a winner in overtime. Greg McDermott almost just like playfully collapsed on the ground. I almost playfully collapsed on the ground in the green room here in HQ because I thought it was going in. I thought we were about ready to start podcasting two minutes after that. And McDermott just couldn't help but have this big grin on his face. I want I want McDermott's grin in one shining moment. I, it did not lead to the, the game winning shot in that instance, but it was uh how could you not just sit there and smile and, and chuckle at what we got there? Creighton and Oregon, thank you for giving us just a, an awesome, awesome nightcap there. Uh, really, really good stuff. Really cool stuff in the Midwest there. Uh, let's keep it moving here and talk about the other games in the Midwest. And then we will get to DJ Burns and NC State. That is that is unquestionably uh, something I want to get to soon here. But I want to go region by region. And since Creighton, Oregon was the biggest game of the night, uh, we'll stick in that region. Gonzaga beat Kansas. Oh, boy. Um, Gonzaga is in a ninth straight Sweet 16. Kansas could not break through. It ran out of gas after a very entertaining first half. Really great stuff. Kansas led 44-43 at halftime. It's the first team in the history of the tournament to lead at halftime against a team seeded worse because Kansas was the four, Gonzaga was the five. There Until on Saturday, there had never been a team that went into halftime with a lead against the worst team and wound up losing the game by 20 or more points. What were your thoughts on what you saw earlier in the day with the Zags running away from KU 89-68? I mean, yeah, it's just the confidence that Gonzaga is playing with right now. And it, I think it goes back to the win at Kentucky. Like, I, I would love to sort of get 
inside their minds a little bit and, and hear like what that win sort of did to galvanize them. And maybe, hey, maybe they were already there. Uh, but I think uh, certainly from an outside perspective, and you try and find like where did this thing change or where did it flip? I mean, they were they were a bubble team when they went to when they went to Rupp. And they they won at Rupp shooting four of 18 from three, which, oh, by the way, should have been a mega alarm bell on the Cats. Uh, but anyway, Gonzaga now playing with confidence. Uh, right, I mean, Ryan Nimhart didn't even have a great game offensively, but he, he still had 12 assists. So uh, he, he's he's setting them up. And, I mean, you, you just go back to the McNeese game. I thought the McNeese game was going to be uber competitive. I thought it was going to be close. They just throttled McNeese. And then they come out here and throttle Kansas in the second half. I mean, this is a team – that is likely going to get a rematch with a Purdue team that beat them by 10, you know, if Purdue can get past Utah State. So going to be okay. interesting because I think, I think Gonzaga is better. I mean, they're, they're better now than they were then because when they played Purdue the first time, Graham E.K. And, and Ryan Nimhard were still getting used to their roles as the uh, the big-time players on that team after transferring in. Uh, they, they look pretty comfortable in their roles now. Uh, so I'm, I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid of Gonzaga. Uh, and I'll, I'll be seeing him in person in, in Detroit here, you know, in a few days. So uh, yes, I'm kind of excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. I dig that. Cobb will be on hand in Detroit for the, uh, for the regionals there. Um, thoughts on Kansas and then I'll pivot to Gonzaga before we keep it moving here. Kansas, if you're, if you lost track, it has been dropped in the second round in four of the past five uh, tournaments. Uh, the other one, obviously it won the national title in 2022, but you com- you pair that with the fact that it was the second largest NCAA tournament loss in school history. The largest came the COVID tournament, 2021. They got rolled, if you'll recall, by USC in the second round there. And this was also Kansas's 11th loss. It's the most that they've had in the season since 88-89. That was Roy Williams' first year afterward. And we don't we're not going to play the video because we're going to try and be quick here. But uh, Bill Self had a had a quote that got shared shared a ton that basically said he'd been thinking about next season. Uh, for the past few weeks, if not back to February, and the 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 broader context of the quote is is really what what should be shared here. And, and just in terms of Kansas didn't have it didn't have depth, uh, it became an issue, and, and that like it's what got him out of the tournament. Uh, Gonzaga is also looking tremendous, but uh, at a certain point, not having McCuller and just you're going up against a team like that, you're going to get got, and that's what happened here. Uh, interesting times ahead for KU. Uh, McCuller done. Dickinson has a season of eligibility left because of COVID. Uh, I guess we wait and see on that. Honestly, I, I don't know one way or another what's 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 happening there. I'm pretty sure, though, he's got another season of eligibility, but there will be some like major roster turnover here. And it's Kansas like it's going to get dudes. But this was the preseason number one team in the AP top 25. And back in October, when everyone just seemed to be so fully on board with Kansas as the number one team. I resisted that because it just seemed too group thinking as we tend to get by the time these polls happen because of off season rankings and updating these things. Every time there's a big addition in the portal. 0809 North Carolina is the last team to uh, be preseason number one and cut down the, uh, the national championship nets for Gonzaga real quick here, Cobb. Uh, Nembar's 12 assists were the most assists in a single tournament game in Gonzaga history. 5-5-12, and 12, an interesting line, but got it done. And then Watson with a game high, 21.6 rebounds. Four guys on Gonzaga's roster went for 15 plus points and shot 60% from the field in this game. And the run that Gonzaga, it was just, it was so impressive how they just, they turned off Kansas's water. It was a 32 to four run coming out of the break after being down 49, 48. There was a spell there where Kansas was two of 23 from the field when Gonzaga was on that 32 to four run. And also across 26 plus minutes of game time, Gonzaga did not miss consecutive field goals. Just a really dominating performance. Congrats to the Zags. Ninth straight Sweet 16. There's two ways you can look at it. UCLA technically has the record, but when it did it, it went 14 times. When there were 16 teams in a tournament field, it it did it. But that predates the expansion of the field, so it's almost like it doesn't fully count. Um, Carolina also started in 81-93 to when it went 13 straight times. That was at least since the field expanded. But Gonzaga, to do this here, and technically be tied for Duke for second since the you know the Sweet 16, as I guess as we know it proper, was in 75. Uh, it's just really, really impressive by, by Mark Few and Co. to continue to be able to do this. Um, Gonzaga's won 11 of his past 12. I saw this shared a couple by a couple people on Twitter. It's been number one in Torvik on offense since uh, since the start of February. Really, really yeah. impressive stuff. You know, St. Mary's had been like number eight at Torvik overall, and then we also we also what happened there. So anyway. Yeah, I know. Listen, hey, one game, one winner go home. It'll happen. 
Yeah. You know? No. You can be vulnerable to it. We'll see. Uh, let's keep it moving in the Midwest. Tennessee won 62-58. For those who are unfamiliar, the Vols are Cubs. Uh, it's Cubs alma mater there. Uh, Tennessee is in back-to-back Sweet 16s for the second time in school history. Previously, it was 07-08. It won this game despite shooting 3 of 25 from beyond the arc. That's 12%. It's the lowest three-point percentage for a team in a tournament win in the history of the event with a minimum of at least at least 25 attempts. So there's a little bit of a qualifier there. Credit to our CBS Sports Research people for that nugget. It's pretty uh, pretty impressive. So how'd they get it done? They they ruled the paint. They had 14 offensive rebounds. Uh, Dalton Connect wasn't even his best self, but he finished with 18 and 9, and 14 of those points came in the second half. Your thoughts on what you saw from Tennessee and Texas? And just like it was a just okay game, but for Tennessee fans, it's big because second seeded team, you didn't get upset in the first weekend. You're at least to the Sweet 16. I would still say, in order to uh, to validate a lot of the hype around the team, you got to win at least one more game. You're going to play Creighton, oh by the way, uh, down there in the Midwest. Your thoughts on? Uh, on UT beating UT. Yeah, consecutive Sweet 16s for the first time since the Pearl era. So that that's something from, from the Tennessee side of it. Maybe the Hornets rank 29th in the NBA in offenses of efficiency because they have to play 41 games a year on those rims. I mean, sorry, not a that kind of a low blow. Um, but just just yeah, a thought. They were tight. Yeah, I got you. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go from the, uh, the the Texas side of this for a second. I mean, Dylan DeSue had a couple that were all the way down. I mean, like like made, made shots that that decided at the last second to come up, you know, for, for, from the net and, and be misses. And that that killed him. And and not as in the chat here talking to me now. So, uh, no, <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was a hideous game. It was an ugly game. But the good thing about Tennessee is that they're built to win uh, when the game gets like that. Because, yes, they took these major offensive strides this season by adding Dalton Connect and going a little bit more up tempo. But in doing that, they didn't abandon the defensive identity that's been the hallmark of the program under Rick Barnes. So now you got a situation where Tennessee is 10 and one this season when they've made fewer than eight three pointers. A lot of teams with a with a, a gunslinger like Dalton Connect, uh, if they make fewer than eight three pointers, they're not going to be 10 and one over the course of the season in those games. Tennessee is. And, and I think that's why a lot of people have thought this team was built for March because they can win a game in the mud when they need to. What makes this team different, though, is that they don't have to always play in the mud. And, and over the past few years, they always had to play in the mud. And Dalton Connect, when he's on, he gives them something else to where uh, they can be more dynamic offensively. Uh, I think Creighton is is a is an opponent who will bring some of that offensive dynamism uh, out of them. And, and so I'm really excited for that matchup. It, it, Creighton Creighton's a phenomenal team. I think it's going to be a really fun game. That's uh, we, we as a function of of some really nicely seated teams getting it done and squeaking into the second weekend. We are set up with some with some good uh, regional semi matchups there. And obviously we'll we'll preview those as we get deeper into the week. Want to more uh, kind of reflect on what we have here and what played out in front of us on uh, throughout on Saturday. Uh, but yes, no good uh, good job out of Tennessee to hold on. Texas made it interesting late. Um, for Rick Barnes, this is back-to-back second weekend showings for him. First time since he went three years in a row, 02, 03, 04. The 03 year was the year he made the final four. A uh, long time coming for Barnes, no no question. There was a lot of, you know, I, I thought for a couple schools here, like Arizona, for Purdue, which has to play on Sunday, we'll see if they can get past Utah State. But for Tennessee, maybe a little bit with Iowa State, Iowa State but not as much. Like getting into the Sweet 16 to kind of reinforce your bona fides, I thought was important. Uh, for Max Asmus, by the way, he is career is done. He finishes as the eighth all-time leading scorer in men's D1 history. 3,132 points for Max Asmus. Um, congrats on a heck of a career. Oral Roberts made a made a big run in the COVID tournament in 21 and did well for himself, transferring up, could more than hold his own, playing for Texas there. Good stuff. We'll see if Tennessee's defense can continue. In the tournament so far, through two games, opponents averaging 53.5 points, shooting 33% from the field, 23.4% from beyond the arc. It's good stuff from uh, from out of them. Let's scoot on down. Let's talk NC State Oakland here. So that was an over. That was the, our other overtime game. Pittsburgh got the OT stuff. Shots to Pittsburgh. Steel City getting the best of games. You got the double OT with Creighton and Oregon, and then earlier in the evening you had NC State seventy nine, Oakland seventy three. I got thoughts on it, but I'm sending it right back over the net to you, buddy. Cobb, what are your thoughts on eleven uh, seeded NC State winning its seventh game? I guess in what a twelve day span here. Incredible from being down at the half in its first ACC tournament game to Louisville. To now breaking through, making the Sweet 16. Yeah, uh, shout out Danny Cannell. Did you see him get some FaceTime on on the broadcast? The one of the co-hosts of the Cover Three podcast. 
Yes, I did see that. Uh, ben Middlebrooks, who plays for NC State. In fact, shouts to Chip Patterson, who's here doing HQ work with us as well, flew up. I missed it. He told me, I said, his son-in-law? I don't even, I, I forget. Med Middlebrooks is connected by family, by blood, I guess, to Danny Cannell, and that's why he was on hand for NC State. Yeah, I want to say, I want to say nephew. I think, I think. Nephew, the new, there we go. There we go. That's what it was. Yes, yes. Right. Danny Cannell's nephew. So uh, super random, but uh, cover three, uh, you know, synergy there. I thought that was, that was kind of funny looking up and randomly seeing a uh, former, former <laughs> Florida State quarterback uh, on the screen there. But I mean, I think the ultimate sort of takeaway, I mean, this was actually one of the better games of the day. Uh, yeah, really it was number two. It was number two. Yeah, it was phenomenal. And uh, Jack Golke was he he delivered a lot of times like, OK, I flash back and you're going to have to help me remember the name here. But there was a kid from Wofford who just went off in the first Fletcher round. McGee. Fletcher yeah. McGee. And then he went like over 12 in, in the next round. I want to say that was Kentucky uh, when that happened. And it was uh, it was a tough deal. Sometimes it happens, though. Well, well Golke delivered. Uh, I know like it, ultimately in the end there, there were a few desperation misses uh, that maybe deflate his numbers i think he ended up six of 17 or something right but but he hit shots and, and that made the game fun and townsend was phenomenal as well but dj burns man uh what more can you say about that that man he's he's reached double figures in every game on this postseason run he had 24 and 11 today and matt this is a guy it's been a long time since i was on the tennessee beat because prior to this i was on the grizzlies beat and then prior to that i was on the tennessee beat i i covered DJ Burns when he was at Tennessee, his redshirt year. And you know what they said, you know, we're going to redshirt him. And I don't, I'm not blaming Tennessee for this, whatever. Like they were like, Oh, you know, we're going to, we're going to redshirt him, you know, uh, get him in shape. Right. You know, and you know, here he is six year in college basketball and like he, he is who he is. Right. And, and there's something to be said for that. Like he is who he is. And like, he knows that he embraces that and it works uh, for him. And they, they're riding that and they're, they're embracing who he is. And I don't know. It's just, it's just fun to see, um, that team and, and that guy get their moment. Uh, let's let's start on NC State before we uh, sing our swan song for Oakland and uh, and the fighting goalkeys there. Uh, this is, you know, there was a little quick chat in our in our Slack chat about uh, is NC State a Cinderella? No, it's not. I mean, if you're a high major team and you make a run, you're not a Cinderella. I'm sorry, Cinderella is reserved for for programs, the hundreds that come from mid major conferences and and win a game or two or three in the tournament. There, you're just on a you're on a sweet sleeper run, okay, or a sweet sleeper sprint, something like you could be a sleeper or a dark horse, and that's what NC State is here. It's coming through, and it's made its eighth Sweet 16 appearance in program history, and it did it by getting all starters with at least 11 points. Uh, you had Burns and Mohamed Diara before he fouled out. I mean, he had a double double. Burns 24, 11, and four assists. He's the first NC State player with 20 points and 10 or more rebounds in a tournament game since Lorenzo Charles in 85. How about that? DJ Burns, you you deserve it, man. He is, the, we all won as a nation because no matter who won this game, we were either getting DJ Burns or Jack Olkey in the Sweet 16. That's what the NCAA tournament can do for you. Really impressive stuff out of out of the Wolfpack there. Diara, 13 boards before he fou fouled out. He's just, it's, it's great to see. You know what I like seeing is these teams that are just, they're off the radar most of the season. And then if they can somehow by, you know, a miracle run and what NC state's doing right now, I mean, it's, it's, it's UConn 2011 esque, obviously they got to win the title to, to truly match it, but to go from being 17 and 14, then trailing down to Louisville early in the ACC tournament to start the, and now you've got guys like Casey Morsell, Mike O'Connell, what he, I mean, he came up big there. And, oh boy, you scared the crap out of me. He scared the crap out of me. Chip. Chip Patterson <laughs> came in here, cover three zone. Hey, you two. as we're talking NC State, as we're talking NC State. You here, the, the mic is yours for literally 45 seconds. Go nuts on NC State. This program was cursed. It started with Chris Corciani's travel call against Georgetown in the 1989 NCAA tournament, one of the worst calls in NCAA tournament history. And it started with having to go through the five teams that had won a national championship besides the Wolfpack in the ACC tournament. And it's continued with, I mean, how many bad breaks did you think were going to happen? And yet they get it done. The curse is lifted. It's all gravy can from I, here. Can I get your Wolfpack? You get it right here? Yeah. Like that one right there? The, oh, here we go. All right. I got to finish this show, Chip. All right, later. But close it behind you. Ah! If you aren't watching, go ahead and bring that part up on YouTube there. That's uh, That was incredible for him to do that. He just got done his HQ shift. 
I had a thought. Oh, it's great to see that these players are starting to get some recognition for, you know, putting in the work. And, and that's just, that's really, 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 really cool. So congrats to NC state. We'll talk more on you as we move forward here for Oakland, Trey Townsend, 30 and 13. What a, what a show for him. Like Golke was awesome. He set the NCAA record for most three points, uh, made shots in his first two tournament games with 15. He had 22 here, hit a couple of big ones. He had an and one that was huge and really thought we thought that Oakland might have it. Um, I guess, no, he had 16 made threes, not 15. Um, Awesome stuff from him and Townsend. And unfortunately for Oakland and 14 seeds, they are now 0-7 all time. When 14 seeds break through to play specifically an 11 seed in the second round, have never defeated an 11 seed here. But Golke is uh, he's a march immortal. And, and they will be remembered. That win over Kentucky is part of the hype and sizzle reel montage. I think I said that on, on the show two nights ago. And, uh, and I think the thing that's things for the people that were hoping to, for Oakland to break through and make the second weekend and continue the story is the team didn't even get its first lead of the game till 249. It looked like they were going to steal it. And then they had the play at the end of regulation where it was just botched. They didn't even get a shot off and it wound up, it wound up rightfully being called uh, by off of Oakland because you had Diara's pinky touching it, but it was actually off of Chris Conway's, the, his fingertips. And then NC state will actually almost hit a prayer to, to win it in regulation there. But but good stuff out of the Grizzlies and Greg Campy and a run that we won't forget. Like they they are they, they are still they'll be one of the five or six biggest things, and maybe one of the two or three biggest things about this tournament, no matter how it plays out from here. Any closing thoughts from you on the Golden Grizzlies? No, it was a lot of fun. You were you legitimately looked terrified when I I did not know. He, did you know that he was behind me? Yeah. How did you not see him? Like you can. See I was him. I was locked in on my take. <laughs> I, I just thought you were like playing it off. That had been. Here's the, it had been a while since someone had actually like made me jump that I'm talking like five, six, seven years long. It's been a while. Yeah. I usually, well, ha I usually have a good sensory on that, but I'm where I'm wearing the cans and my feeds a little, you know, and this is like quasi soundproof room. I don't know. Well, well next played by chip. No, I mean, Sam, the scene, he's going to pop through that door. He's just, not coming on the show. Not tonight. Oh, not tonight. Okay. Not, not to, uh, not tonight. You got any clothing thoughts on, uh, on Oakland and uh, and what it did there with uh, going Golki. No, it was fun and and I love the conversation you and Gary had uh, on the, one of the preview shows leading up to the tournament where you went in depth on talking to Greg. Gary told his story about how he wrote about Greg and you know the near death experience that he had several years ago. Just the, I, I love that conversation. Uh, go go back and find that. It, it's worthwhile. Cra crazy awesome run for those guys. Um, I just I enjoyed every minute of watching their their time in the dance and. Uh, I mean, it was cool seeing seeing Golki come out yeah. after everything was over, taking pictures with people in the stands, including this little kid in a Kentucky uniform who comes up to him and they take a picture together. And oh uh, wow, uh, I mean, I, that that's what this this whole thing is all about. They've already shared the screen grab of Chip scaring the crap out of me in our Slack room. Love to see it. Let's keep it moving here. And from here on out, not as much uh, compelling stuff, but we're going to touch on every single result here. Carolina beat in the West. Carolina beat Michigan State 85-69. UNC is going to play the winner of Grand Canyon in Alabama. That game's going to happen on Sunday. Carolina is 6-0 all-time versus Michigan State in the tournament. They are now in a record 31st Sweet 16 showing. Um, good on UNC. They, you know, we had some intrigue early. Michigan State came out, came out hot. Uh, but then UNC went on a 14 to two run in the second half and changed a five point game into a 17 point margin and only had five turnovers all, all afternoon there. You had good stuff out of RJ Davis and Baycott. They combined for 38 points. Ingram, Harrison Ingram had 17 as well. Your thoughts on, uh, on Carolina getting through with two wins by double digits and, you know, being devoid of really any drama here in the first weekend cup. Yeah, we got Harrison Ingram playing the Brady Manic role, maybe even better than Brady Manic uh, out here knocking down threes as a power conference, power forward transfer for a team with with aspirations. Uh, but certainly playing the Brady Manic role better than Pete Nance did. Uh, yeah, those three guys, uh, Davis, Baycott, Ingram, awesome. I got one uh, more shout out for you from UNC. I thought Seth Trimble was awesome defensively. And this is going to go overlooked, but in that first half, Tyson Walker was deep in his bag. Michigan State was up like 11 points. They were on a roll, and then they were in transition, and Tyson Walker was trying to get a shot up. He went with a pump fake. Trimble stayed down on the pump fake, forced them into a bad look, and then the momentum started to swing. And when we go to rank our top 100 players next year, I know I'm getting like way ahead of myself here. 
Yeah. I think I'm going to have Seth Trimble on that list. Uh, he's going to be somebody that, that I vote for because of what all UNC is going to lose, they're going to need him and want him to do more offensively. And he's shown that he can do that. But he's already a really, 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 really high level defender. He showed that to me today. I thought he was an underrated and low key, like special part of North Carolina making that comeback. Yeah. Uh, really just impressive stuff on on the roster building for for Carolina and Hubert Davis really hitting it in the portal. Um, we mentioned this in the offseason where they all came from losing situations. And I wondered how that might impact a, a program that was coming off a losing season, you know, versus expectations with UNC a year ago. And it's worked really, really well. So credit to that staff, credit to Hubert Davis getting there into this into the Sweet 16. We'll preview Carolina even more so moving forward. Uh, Tom Izzo uh, was asked, this is a quick clip. I think this might be all 10 seconds there. But I just I thought it was, you know, vintage Izzo here. He got asked uh, yeah, maybe about not necessarily his future, but, you know, coming up short here as of late in the tournament. MSU's had some stumbles. And uh, now to go ahead and play this, here's what Izzo told the assembled media real quick on uh, on his just his determination to have at least one more deep run in him before he hangs it all up. I'm getting back to a deeper run in this tournament. And I'm going to die trying. Okay, Tom. Okay, Tom Izzo. Oh, well, it's a quick one, but uh, all right. We'll see if Michigan State can do it. They're going to lose some key pieces. On the whole, a disappointing season for MSU. Going preseason top five team. Uh, got a gracious seed. Finish, well, right now they're 16th at Ken Palm here. Um, 20 and 15 overall. I, I'm interested to see what uh, what awaits for for the Spartans in, next year and with their roster because it has been... All of since all the way back in 2019 was the last time a Tom Izzo coach team made a final four. So uh, MSU fans know that they are due. These are not promised to anyone. And uh, yeah, intriguing times await for them uh, in the portal. And uh, he's got, you know, he's got solid recruiting class coming in as well. I don't know where they'll rank in the preseason polls, but I would anticipate, I think that Izzo should have a top 25 team. Obviously, you've got an interesting dynamic now with Izzo coming down, you know, the 16th, 17th, or 18th hole of his career. And now he's got Dusty May that just got to Michigan. And so different dynamics to play there, Cobb. No, yeah, I had not seen that video. I'm literally still processing that because that was like, that was pretty next level. And I believe him. I believe that he will get Michigan State back to a deep run or that he will die trying. Like, I, I don't doubt a word that he said in that clip. In the West, Arizona beat Dayton 78-68. This was a pretty solid game on the whole. Um, Dayton just didn't quite have enough. Arizona ripped it. It was a it was a clear cut win for the Wildcats. Tommy Lloyd on the two line gets it done there in the bottom left corner of your bracket. And Arizona will play the winner of Baylor Clemson. That game is on Sunday. Obviously, this is the twentieth Sweet Sixteen appearance in Arizona's history, and uh, they were able to hold on after they got Dayton down seventeen in this game. Dayton then peeled off a sixteen to three run uh, from the first half, and then going into the second, got it as close as to. Uh, three at one point and I thought they might have a chance but credit to Zona they were able to continue to get wins in this tournament you know there's only been two but they've gotten 70 paint points 63 points from beyond the arc 26 points from the foul line and they've only have four they've made two mid-range shots in the, in the first two games there so they're they're kind of sticking to the philosophy of of trying to get uh, get their points the most efficient ways, and Caleb Love has certainly helped with that. He's averaging eight and a half points in these first two tournament games. Twelve of thirty two from the field, not great. Six of twenty from three point range, not great. But he, uh, if you watch the game, you know that he was a big factor, particularly in that first half, and going for nineteen points, five assists. Right now, um, it's not just him. Pella Larson's played well on the whole. Arizona's uh, Arizona's looking pretty good. Dayton shouts to you. That was a, that was a game effort to Ron Holmes, Kobe Brea, Kobe Elvis. They, they came ready to play early tip, by the way, 10 45 local, uh, good game. I thought it would be closer, but Arizona moves on. What were your thoughts, cop? Yeah. I also want to shout out to uh, Jaden Bradley and Keyshot Johnson. Cause you're right. Caleb love did most of his damage in the first half. And that's a team and a player who, when he goes cold or, or whatever, like we've seen the Caleb Love experience over the years, right? Like we all know what that is. Yeah. And in the second half, we got we got the less attractive version of the Caleb Love experience. And Jaden Bradley and Keisha Johnson were there to pick him up. And one thing that stood out to me was about Jaden Bradley because he committed to Arizona as a transfer from Alabama on May the 3rd. On May the 30th, 
Caleb Love committed. So you had a guy who I think was talked to about a specific role. And then that role changed when Caleb Love joined the fold. And so I got it right here. Uh, he went from averaging, this is Jaden Bradley, went from averaging 19.8 minutes and 6.4 points per game at Alabama to averaging 19.9 minutes and 6.5 points at Arizona. He's playing the exact same role that he played at Alabama last year. He transferred from Alabama to get a bigger role. But here he is, and like Tommy Lloyd was so just like effusive in his praise for Jaden Bradley after the game because he's a really good player. And Jaden Bradley, uh, you know, Tommy Lloyd said today, you know, is going to go down as, as one of the best to, to play here, uh, you know, as, as the years progress and his role does finally increase. But that's those are the teams and those are the players that like have a chance in this thing is it's the ones, the ones who embrace their roles and the ones who stick with it. Right. Like even when things aren't going their way. And I just thought that like Jaden Bradley's second half performance embodied that today because he didn't have to stick around when, when Caleb Love came in or he could have been pretty upset about that. And maybe he was, who knows, but anyway, uh, here, here they were on the biggest stage in college basketball. Caleb Love was a little bit off in the second half and uh, Jaden Bradley came up big and uh, Tommy Lloyd's remarks, go and find them. I mean, they're, they're you know, they tell you everything you, you, need, you need to know about, you know, who Jaden Bradley is for that team. Yeah, good stuff there, Cobb. Uh, let's close it out with the East. I'll give both results and a couple nuggets and then give me your closing thoughts here. Iowa State, the two seed, beat Washington State, the seven, 67-56. Illinois, it was never, unfortunately, it was just never a game. The worst game of the day was Illinois, 89-63 over Duquesne. It is a big result for Illinois fans. They are Their team is in the Sweet 16 for the first time since 05. Terrence Jr. Jr. had 30 points. Um, Illinois just started out uh, just they made they made 20 of their first 29 shots. It was just it was not it was not a game. Damask had 22 and seven dimes. Uh, Keith Danbrot's career is over. He has 441 career wins. And uh, and it was a really cool thing, not for him just to even get to the tournament with the auto bid, but get a win. That's good stuff for the Dukes. Uh, happy to see that. Happy for them to get it done. Washington State is out. Uh, gets to the tournament for the first time since 08 and gets a win. Really, really cool. So we'll have Iowa State playing Illinois. This is the seventh Sweet 16 in Iowa State's history. It's its second in its last three years. TJ Otzelberger, I could not believe when I saw this nugget. He is the only coach in the history of Iowa State's men's program to make multiple Sweet 16s. He's the only one, and he's at two and three years. Unlike Illinois, Iowa State did not start the game well. Washington State was up early. Iowa State missed his first nine shots. But it came back and roared. And Taman Lipsy had himself a really nice night. 15 points, 5 rebounds, 4 dimes. Jalen Wells for Washington State countered with 20 points overall. Um, good stuff for out of, uh, out of Iowa State, which is heading into the Sweet 16 with a career 3 or, yeah, 3, or one, in, what, 1, 2, 3. I'm looking at my notes here. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So they are 1 in 5 in the Sweet 16. They've lost their last three appearances in the in the Sweet 16 here. We'll see if they can kind of break through. Uh, not a ton to take from either of these games, um, but your thoughts on Iowa State and or Illinois Cup? Yeah, just to reiterate, when TJ Alselberger took the job, that program was coming off of a 2-22 and season. He, he's now taking them to the Sweet 16 in two of his first three years. That's pretty remarkable. Also, uh, shout out to the Iowa State fans. It really came through on the broadcast. Like, I know Nebraska is, like, not all that far away from from Ames, right? Like that's a relatively easy trip, but they made that place seem like it was Hilton Coliseum on TV, which I'm sure they did the same thing in Kansas city for the big 12 tournament. And just shout out to like the corn territory in general, because I'm at the Memphis games, you know, this weekend and the Nebraska fans were unreal uh, at FedEx forum in Memphis the other night. So obviously this region of the country is supporting college basketball at a really high clip. Uh, curious to see Matt, uh, can the Iowa state fans keep that up in Boston uh, here in a few days? That's going to be, I think they'll show up in good numbers. Uh, Illinois fans will travel well as well. UConn fans will dominate the building if UConn can get past Northwestern and get there. And then we'll see it'll either be San Diego State or Yale uh, that'll be breaking through as well uh, in the east there. But uh, another uh, that's a really good two versus three. Iowa State versus Illinois. Uh, love to love to see that. Um, yeah, what a matchup. No, just a great, great, great matchup there. Uh, our poll question, by the way, on the night, as, as we get to the end of the show here, was which two seed do you trust the most to make the Final Four after what we've seen the first weekend of the two seeds that won on Saturday? We had Arizona win, Creighton win, Tennessee, and that's actually the order. Arizona, 48% of the vote. 
maybe that's the region. Creighton is 27%. Or no, oh, so hold on. Nada said which high seed. Okay, I thought at the start I said which two seed to put in, but he put in two twos and a three. So Arizona, Iowa State's not in this, uh, is not in this poll, Nada. So Arizona, then Creighton, then Tennessee, kind of splitting, which makes sense. I think that's a that's pretty close to a toss up there overall. Um, among all the two seeds, I would still trust Arizona the most in that spot. And I thought it was a good weekend for for Arizona, but Iowa State, man, just keep keeps on reinforcing uh, reinforcing it all. Before we get out of here, uh, real quick, a look at a look at the schedule that awaits us on Sunday in the second half of the second round. Things will get going with Colorado versus Marquette. Um, that uh, that's a twelve ten p.m. Eastern tip on CBS. Then, well, that's a standalone game. Then we'll have Utah State versus Purdue out in the Midwest. That's uh, the Colorado State Marquette ones in the South. Utah versus Purdue, 240 Eastern, CBS approximately. And then James Madison versus Duke in Brooklyn. I'll be there. I'll be reporting for HQ. Um, that is a 515 p.m. Eastern approximate tip from Barclays. And then we get going with the multi-view situation. Clemson versus Baylor, 610 Eastern on TNT. Then an hour later, Grand Canyon versus Alabama. Oh, boy, buddy. What is that one going to look like? 710 Eastern on TBS. You will have 745. How about UConn? The reigning champs getting the true TV game. 745 approximately versus Northwestern from Barclays Center. 840 Texas A&M versus Houston. And then we wrap up the day with Yale versus San Diego State at approximately 940 uh, p.m. Eastern on TBS. That game will be coming to you from Spokane. Cobb. What is your favorite matchup? How about this? Give me the give me the upset of the day that you think will happen and your favorite matchup of the day. And if it's the same, then give me your second favorite matchup if it's if it already matches your upset pick. Yeah, I mean, I guess my my upset pick of the day is Texas A&M over Houston. And this is not reflected in my bracket, actually. But and look, I'll be totally transparent here. This is unduly influenced by the fact that I've seen Texas A&M in person three times over the last two weeks, first at the SEC tournament okay. and now here. In here we go. Right. So let's just be real about that. But uh, this is a team that was one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the country all season long, Texas A&M. They were awful. 28.4% going into the NCAA tournament, 351st in the country at the time. Uh, and now here they are like making double-digit threes like every other game. And uh, you know they were just in fuego against Nebraska. They put up 97 against Kentucky, which I realize is easy to do. Uh, but I did, I'm just curious. Like Houston's a little depleted on the depth end. These two played a four-point game on a neutral court several months ago. I think Texas A&M is a lot better now than it was then. And uh, I just think the Aggies have a serious shot definitely to cover a 10 and a half point spread or whatever it is, but uh, maybe even to win straight up. So that's my kind of upset special of the day. But I think my favorite matchup has got to be Duke James Madison, just for obvious reasons. I mean, it's Duke. It's one of the best sort of mid-major stories of the year in James Madison and a really, really good JMU team. So that's going to be a really fun game, I think. My... So I have JMU over Duke in my bracket, but I will eschew putting that as the upset pick and say that's my favorite matchup of the day. James Madison versus Duke. Having watched James Madison in person, team is legit. I think it, I think that game has such a wonderful chance of being a riveting 40 minutes. So I'm really looking forward to being in the building for that one. But I'm going to pick another upset I have in my bracket. I, I have Colorado over Marquette getting to the Sweet 16. The Buffaloes. I'll tell you what, the three best games of the tournament so far. Uh, pick your order, I guess. Uh, Creighton, Oregon's uh, probably one, but whatever. Uh, Colorado, Florida, both teams getting to 100, and then Oakland, Kentucky, probably. But we've had a lot of, we've had some good games yet. No true buzzer beater yet. We've had some good ones. I like the Buffs uh, with their offense, their talent. KJ Simpson, Tristan De Silva, really getting uh, getting things done there. Lampkins just a hoss down low, and Cody Williams. You know the talent's kind of obvious there. Uh, KJ Simpson versus Tyler Kolick. Let's go. Nice little 12, 10 Eastern tip on CBS. That's a good way to get the day going in a standalone game. So can't wait for Sunday. Uh, plan as of now, I believe is for Parrish and Boone to give you your recap because I'm going to be, I'll be at Barclays. I'll be occupied. Although don't hold me to it. If, uh, if it's wild enough and I, and I have the capacity to do so, I might hop on, um, a real quick for like a five minute recap if we can, if we're in position, but it's going to be a little bit of a wild day and I got to drive back from Barclays back home to Connecticut late on Sunday. So if you don't get me on the show at all on Sunday, GP and I will reconvene uh, not so, not so long after to talk sweet 16, to talk matchups, to talk all that good stuff. Any closing thoughts, Cobb, or should we, uh, should we head out here? That's a wrap, man. 
I don't do the shouts. I am not. Uh, I'm not Gary Parish. Uh, if you are a longtime listener of the show and are familiar with the format, when I host, then uh, then you know that. But I appreciate everyone stopping by, hopping in the chat here on a late Saturday night after a good uh, good Saturday. I got to feel Saturday was good. Mark me down. Sunday's an even better day. I think Sunday will be even better with the tournament there. So for everyone watching, we appreciate you. If you like the show, be sure to tell a friend. Thank you so much. I on College Basketball Podcast will be back on Sunday night with the full recap when we get to a full Sweet 16 teams. Appreciate you so much, and we will talk to you then.